recording recap on Mike. Boom. So, <laughs> this is, um, has anyone ever seen this graph? This is a real graph. And it's, uh, it's, it's a graph that shows a correlation between Internet Explorer usage and, and US murder rate. It's very, uh, very, very interesting. Um, so I, this is a meme I made myself right here. So Drupal Core has supported Internet Explorer since forever. Uh, Drupal 10, which is going to be released this summer, will not support Internet Explorer. So this picture right here, I know, right? This picture right here is Drupal's front end, and then you have all this gunk at the bottom basically slowing it down. That gunk is Internet Explorer right there. So uh, we're going to talk about, we, of course we have like lots of memes. We're going to talk about the history and backwards compatibility problem that we have. Uh, what's in core now and some cool CSS features. So even if you're not a Drupal person but you know uh, a bit about CSS, I'm probably going to teach you something. You're going to, uh, hopefully at the end you'll be super excited about it because I am. And we're going to talk about how core is going to use this. Hey Christina. Yeah. So who here has seen this before? It's Drupal, right? Yeah. So this is Bartik. This is the current uh, default thing for Drupal. This um, this was developed in like 2009, 2010, um, and uh, it looks like it was developed in 2009, 2010. You know, it's not bad, and it was fun. It was it was it was. It's a leading cause fun. Yeah, like. It just doesn't look good anymore, you know, so, and who here has seen this? Yeah, this is Savin. This is the current default backend team for, for, for Drupal Core, you know, and this was also designed in 2009, 2010-ish, you know? Um, so this is Olivera. This is the new thing that I have been pouring my blood, sweat, and tears into, and it is currently stable, but it's not yet the default, but that's going to happen, because if it doesn't happen, I'm going to... Um, we're gonna have some words. Murder rate. Yeah, the murder rate will go back up. <laughs> You're gonna stick Dexter on the mark here. Yeah, exactly. Dexter's me. Dexter has like a waggy tail, and he swings it so hard it hurts. Um, anyway, so look at this. It has a drop-down menu. You know, welcome to 2010. You know, <laughs> but yeah. So we have drop-down menus, and it's it's super accessible. It's beautiful. Uh, does anyone know who is one of the designers of this thing? This man right here. Jared Pancha. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I work with Jared, and so Jared and Jen Witkowski are like the two lead designers, and we went through this whole review system. What's up, Andy and Steve? Uh, and so we went through this whole review system with a lot of stakeholders, including people like Dries, Gabor, Lowry, and all that other other stuff. It's $5 admission, everybody. Okay. Got it. Yeah, or a, or a beer. My sponsorship right. covered that. Yeah, <laughs> you're admitted. <laughs> so so yeah, so that's Olivero, and this is Claro. Uh, this is what the new backend is going to look like. Does anybody know who's who here is working on Claro? This amazing person right here, Christina. Uh, she has. While well, I have been pouring my blood, sweat, tears into Olivero, Claro, uh, Christina has been pouring her blood, sweat, tears into Claro. And together, we're going to make Drupal beautiful. Um, so this is kind of, you know, Internet Explorer support course. So like, this is where we're at right here. Drupal 7, you know, we support Internet Explorer 6, believe it or not. And that's when, our, that's when 7 and uh, Bartek were designed. Drupal 8 came out, we support IE9. Drupal 9 came out, we support IE11. Uh, and then no IE in Drupal 10. So this is June, but it's probably going to be like September or something, because now we're like bumping up a PHP requirement. Um, so Drupal 10, right right now, what we do support in Drupal 10 is things like Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Edge, and Opera, uh, and Safari for iOS. And we and 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 then we have like things like Firefox ESR. Firefox ESR is this uh, version of Firefox that's it's called extended extended support release. And basically, what that means is they don't like really update it for every couple of years, but still like way better than IE, you know. Um, so yeah, um, so this is a big deal because all these browsers update pretty regularly, you know? So like there's a whole bunch of new browser stuff coming out, including like things like, uh, like what is it, uh, layers, CSS layers, CSS uh, container queries. There's a whole bunch of cool stuff coming out. And 
the thing is we're going to be able to support it fairly rapidly because we're not stuck supporting IE. All we've got to wait is for our, our supported browsers to catch up, and then boom, it's going to be awesome. I'm going to talk about these features coming up, by the way. Um, so in Drupal core, we do use a lot of... Hey, Kat. We use a lot of modern CSS features. Um, I saved a seat right for you, Kat. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. But you can't sit here. You got oh. it all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll sit right in the front. Um, so uh, Drupal Core does does some pretty cool CSS stuff. Uh, Drupal Core, like 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 we have. Uh, this post CSS tool called post CSS preset uh, env in there, and where JavaScript we do Babel or Babel or Babal, I don't know. Um, <laughs> post CSS preset env is awesome. It does like it's almost like kind of like SAS, but it's, but but what it does is it takes all the future stuff like from CSS in the future and enables you to use it today, and it, and then it transpiles it right. So it's almost like a few, like a, a time traveling tool. I can use CSS from the future today, you know. So it does, so you can do cool things like um, indentation, like SAS like indentation with CSS, because that's going to come out in a couple of years. You can do things like uh, C, uh, logical uh, uh, CSS logical properties. I'll talk what those are. And, and things like that. And, it, and then it, what it will do is it will change those into stuff that browsers support right now. Polyfill. Yeah, well, it won't, Polyfill is a little different. Polyfill uses JavaScript to, to, to like hook in there and do it around. This will just change the syntax, you know? So, so we don't, we're not loading extra JavaScript. So it does stuff like this. This is an example. So this is uh, CSS logical properties up here. And this is indentation that we can use. So you can see like there's stuff like padding block, padding inline end. And I'll talk about what CSS logical properties are in a bit. But basically what it does is it takes this beautiful piece of code and generates this crappy piece of code. <laughs> and, and like which is easier to read? Which is more maintainable? Which is better supported by browsers? That one. You know, so that's why we have to transpile it. How easy is it to, tra to transition into that from less? You talked about SAS. Um, even using less. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> that's a good question. Okay. It depends on your. It depends on your code base. Okay. You know, but I would say it's probably possible. I have done from this to SAS. I still do like SAS, but that's a that's a different thing. Okay. So Babel, um, basically, what we have right now is we use modern JavaScript in core right now. We're writing ES6 style JavaScript. So you can see we're using things like const and 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 stuff like that. And what it does. Babel will transpile it into things like var. This is IE 11 type style code. We're not going to have to do that anymore. There's actually an issue to take that out. So like what these new CSS features are going to enable us to do is make more maintainable code, newer features, and easier to extend. And I'm super excited about especially that last one. So let's talk about some new CSS. I'm going to drink some water because I am so excited. <laughs> this one's so cool. It's a property called all. All or, or all will select all your properties. So, like, let's say I have this like little piece of admin functionality, and I don't want my styles leaking into that. I can use all revert. And that just removes all the styles and then takes it back to the browser default. And it just does it. It just works. So things, think of things like the Drupal settings tray, the like admin components that are loaded on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the front end, or front end components that may, might be loaded on the admin cell. You can use all revert to revert to the browser's default state or default styles and at that point, you can style it. You can style it from the beginning, as opposed to trying to like override crazy, you know, selectors from whatever. That's pretty cool. So like, here's the settings tray right here, and you can see like there's always stuff that like leaks in here. Has anyone ever like worked with Layout Builder? And you have you ever had styles leak into the settings tray? A little bit. Yeah, it's a pain in the butt. We can't use that right now because there's no there's no way to transpile all revert for IE. 
but you, you know, yeah. So this is like the current uh, CSS reset for the settings tray. Like so, like you literally have like it, I'm sure y'all could read this, <laughs> um, but it's like Drupal off canvas applet, Drupal off canvas objects, like all these things to manually, and then all these properties down here to to reset that, and it doesn't even work properly because it's like it's like too hard, you know, and 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 you can't select everything either because like we don't want to, we can't use the universal selector because you don't want to select. SVG elements and stuff because that that was breaking. We did that at one point, so you can just replace that with this, like boom, like a couple lines of code. That's a, yeah. I see everybody's trying to peek over the monitors, but like <laughs> this is a lot easier than that, you know, and that is going to make things a lot more maintainable. So CSS logical properties are super cool if and when you ever develop uh, for a right to left language. So when I'm talking about right to left languages, this is this is like Arabic. I have no clue what it says, but there's other languages like Hebrew and stuff like that. That like instead of reading from the left that way, you're reading from the right that way. And um, so it's see, yeah, they're pretty easy, you know. So like normally you have a property when you're doing CSS right now, it says padding left 10 pixels. Like instead of that, you say padding inline start. So inline is left and right block. Is up and top and bottom, you know. So like you have it. So it, it kind of makes sense. So you got you, this is way too complicated, actually. But <laughs> like uh, you, you got padding block, you know. So or margin block or you know stuff like that. And then uh, and then inline and then you got start and end. And and it just works. And when in doubt, just Google it. But like and, and then you don't have to do the dear RTL thing if y'all know that. So CSS Grid, who here has used CSS Grid? Yeah, CSS Grid is like my second favorite thing, like ever. No, maybe third, but <laughs> it is awesome. So like CSS Grid enables you to easily put stuff in a grid system. So everybody here who is a front end developer has probably used grid systems, things like Bootstrap Grid, like if you're old enough, 960 Grid, or SUSE, or stuff, all those things like that. Those things are complicated compared to CSS Grid. CSS Grid makes things easy. And we kind of use CSS Grid in Olivero right now. You can we'll go back one right there. You can actually see this is Olivero, and we're using CSS Grid. Because believe it or not, Internet Explorer 11 actually supports this rudimentary effed up version of CSS Grid that can be transpiled to. But it can't do quite everything. So like it can't do what's called auto placement and it can't do uh, negative line numbers. So when I say auto placement, I'm talking about you put one thing in one column and the next thing goes after it, not on top of it, you know? Um, so IE 11 doesn't handle that and we have some really crufty code to kind of kind of fix that. And then you have negative grid lines. So like if you, if y'all have done CSS grid and you kind of start, you can say, I want grid column one and it's the first. But you can also do, I want grid column negative one, and it's the last. Or negative two, it's the second from the last, you know? It just makes it really easy. So, like, like let's say, like, you're, you're switching the number of grid, you know, grid uh, columns and stuff, like, on a media query, but you always want it to be the second from each end. You can just do, like, grid column two to negative two instead of, like, having a media query in there that says, like, you know, that actually, like, names the actual column. So that's pretty cool. So this is like the little auto placement hack that, that we have for I-11, where we have the CSS and Olivero, and basically we say like, if we have this CSS class in here that's called I-11 auto row, we do all this messed up stuff right here, we get to rip that out, and that's just nice. You know, I, I hope that, I dearly hope that y'all have never had to deal with this, but uh, just know that we can delete it now. So this is kind of, this is what I was talking about with the, uh, 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 grid the negative line numbers. So instead of saying one negative seven and then one to uh, or one to seven and one to fourteen, you can just say one negative one, and it'll always it'll always span full width. So you're saying all of this is already out of Olivero now? Uh, well, in Drupal ten Olivero. So Drupal ten Olivero. Um, I've been like having so much fun ripping all this code out in Drupal ten Olivero. So I've been I've been kind of going to town with it. Um, but that all being said, like it's not completely out yet. 
But and, and honestly, we're using it now. It's yeah, and Drupal 10 is not not yet stable. But honestly, the Olive Vera and Drupal 10 is so much better than Olive Vera and Drupal 9 because it does not support IE 11. You know. Um. So, yeah. Uh, what am I looking at here? Oh, we're, oh yeah. So we're talking about CSS grid. So like. You can see, like, you ever go into views and you have, like, you can ask, you can, you, you, you say, like, how do I want this to be styled? See, so you, you can do list or grid. So we're actually going to make this work prop. Oh yeah. So this is what we do right now. We have like all these grid helpers in here. I think I might be jumping around right here. So um, this is styles for Olivero to support. IE, uh, IE 11, and you can see that we have multiple, uh, multiple variables, one for each uh, breakpoint. And the reason is, is because CSS variables are not dynamic. Well, IE 11 does not support CSS variables. And so what we do is we compile these CSS variables to its value. But because it's not dynamic, we have to have a different version of that for every single breakpoint. And that's kind of what you're seeing right here. This will be a lot easier. You can see this, is, this code is actually in core, and I have a crying emoji. So it, it, and and, I, and we, we were able to dramatically simplify this. Um, so there's some new focus selectors that are available when you do not support Internet Explorer 11. Uh, focus within is a very, very neat one, and there's also focus visible. Focus within allows you to select an element that has focus on any element inside of that. So that's very useful if you're doing like menu systems or something like that, and if you cannot rely on JavaScript. In Olivero, we use focus within if JavaScript is disabled, so you can still access those sub menus. So we have a uh, see if I have an example right here. Yeah, this looks about right. So I have like, I have the list item, and I say, if that list item has a focus within, I show the menu underneath of that. And, and it, it provides access uh, for keyboard users under there. Now, it's not perfectly accessible because you're not toggling the uh, appropriate ARIA attributes, but it's a good fallback if, C if uh, JavaScript is not available. Um, Yeah, so here is, th this is the CSS that I have that just basically says that if there's no JavaScript, we, we show it. That's just the example CSS. Um, focus visible. So, yeah, have you ever like, you ever click and you see the focus outlines? And I've seen like a lot of designers, they say, Mike, I don't like these focus outlines. And you say, well, you need these for accessibility. Or sometimes the front-end developer does not know that they need those for accessibility, so they just do an outline zero on the focus, which re completely removes focus states. And that is extremely bad for uh, accessibility because at that point you don't know where your focus lies on your page. Um, focus within is a uh, selector that allows the browser to determine if the focus ring should be shown. So the browser will, will basically sense if you're, tap, if you're tabbing around using a screen reader, using any other assistive technology, or if you're using a keyboard, uh, I mean, if you're using a mouse. If you're using a mouse, fo focus within will not like kind of show, focus, focus within uh, will, will not activate, but if you're using a keyboard, it will. So what this enables you to do is it enables you to only show your focus outlines on uh, if a user is using their keyboard, you know, and, and that's, that's pretty cool. We are not using Focus Visible in Drupal Core just because the determination was made by accessibility maintainers that it's not quite ready because there's no way to always activate it. Um, who here has used the CSS not selector? Cool. Uh, I'm seeing a number of hands, but I'm going to explain what it is after I drink this water. So, the not CSS selector is really neat. 
because it allows you to select kind of the opposite of something, you know? So like, let's say I want a, uh, a UL that is not a contextual link. This will select all the ULs that are not contextual links. That's, it's pretty straightforward, right? That's pretty cool. And that's actually supported by Internet Explorer 11. But, um, so this is the selector argument usage or not. So this is very basic right here. This is as a UL that does not have this class. This says a list item that does not match this uh, selector argument. Uh, can you all see that? So basically, you can say, I want to select an element that does not exist under an other element. And that is new. Does that kind of make sense, or am I kind of going too fast? Or? So what you're saying is you want all the list items that belong to unordered lists that are not contextual link, where the parent is not a contextual link class. Or that, that any parent is not a contextual link. Right. I want all list items that do not exist under a contextual link class, or any element with a contextual link class. And this can be more complicated. You know, you can say all list items that are not, you know, on like the dot body dot admin or something like that, you know, or something like that. You can get very complicated in there. That's pretty cool. So, this is the is selector. Has anyone ever heard of the is selector? Cool. Um, is, 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 is. Um, yeah, it's like a note is a note. So it, it allows you to combine selectors, you know? So basically you take, you can take this syntax right here and you can combine it into this. So you can see like this, the rest of this is exactly the same, but these two headings are different. So you can say, is heading one, heading two, and then the, the selector underneath that, right? Does that kind of make sense? That's pretty cool. You thought, you're kind of thinking, well, that just makes things a little shorter, but you can get, I'm, I'm going places with this. Um, where am I going with this code, though? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is where I'm planning on using that code in, in core right here. So right now we have this text content and the CK, CKE editable CSS class up here. And the reason that we have that is because we, we want the text style to show in CK in the CK editor. And then we have a whole bunch of styles down here. And it, and it duplicates all these rules. It duplicates all the selectors and it makes the style sheets larger. And we can simplify that by using is. So let me talk about where. And you're gonna you're gonna have a little deja vu here, but just just go with me. So where combines these selectors, heading one and heading two, and and it just does the same thing as this. <laughs> huh? <laughs> What's the difference between is and where? Where it, you know how I said like CSS grid was my third favorite thing? Where is my second favorite thing? My daughter is my first. So you can see like, but. I don't know, maybe my daughter's my second. I have to think about that. That's, a, <laughs> that's good. Where removes specificity? This, like, is huge because CSS specificity bites everyone in the ass at some point in time. And then you're like, darn it, CSS. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some use cases for this. So, like, you're like, why would I want to remove CSS, CSS specificity? Well... Um, so here, so you can see lit, this list item, and you put is contextual link. This is basically the same specificity as this, you know. So like, this will like be more a more specific selector and override styles than like other things. But if you have where, all the stuff in here, in the parens, doesn't count towards specificity. So you can say. A list item where contextual link has the same specificity as a regular list item. That's pretty cool because when you're defining your base styles, you can define your base styles and get more specific with them. Um, like I, I want all my list items to have these color bullets except for contextual links. 
But when I'm writing CSS against those list items, I don't have to worry about that extra specificity. And like, it takes a like, once you kind of think about the process and like what goes on here, it, it, it can like blow your mind, right? So, so like, you, you, like it, it's, it's complicated to think about how would I, re I, I can remove specificity, right? I'm gonna show more stuff in here. So you can combine where, and then within there, select not. You, you, you can make these complicated CSS selectors in here, right? So I can say list item, all list items that do not exist under contextual links, um, I can select all those and it will still have the same specificity as a regular list item. So when I'm writing CSS down the line, I don't have to worry about writing CSS.contextualLink. You know, to override the CSS. Does that kind of make sense? I'm seeing some nods and some blank faces. I guess I'm just wondering why not just stick with just list item then. I guess. I'm well, because so like if I yeah so why 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 even add not contextual links here? Because I don't want to style those. I don't want to style that for whatever reason. I don't want to style these contextual links that exist in the list item, or I don't want to style this element that exists under this other element. You know, so you can do things. Oh, I'm gonna go back. Uh, I don't know if I have a slide for that, but like you can like, like like let's say in Drupal, like we have like maybe we do a Drupal admin component or something like that, we, or, or like a Drupal like admin class. Say we have this is this is this is Drupal admin, and we add a CSS class to admin components. And I'm doing I'm a front end themer. I can just say list items where not a descendant of a Drupal admin component. Yeah, like the toolbar. And in that like and, and I, I define that CSS, but then I'm writing when I'm writing my CSS later, when I'm writing these list items, I don't have to write these long CSS selectors to override that specificity. Does that kind of make sense? So so you start putting this these complex selectors together and your mind blows. But there's an issue. You see browser. It's a browser that's like, it was developed by China to specifically spy on people. <laughs> and we officially support it and for Drupal core. And so we can't yet do that. So I, I have this issue right here to remove support. And the issue basically says like, hey, this is basically spyware, you know, not to mention like the, the country of India banned it, you know, because of that. And, um, not a lot of people use it, even in China anymore, and so we're going to remove it, and it's probably going to get removed because I will start bugging people, and I think you even hopped in on the issue and said, yeah, we could remove it. CSS clip path is really cool. It takes a SVG path and throws it into your CSS right there, and then what it does is it only shows you that the, the items or like the, the items that are coming through the path. So like, let me show if, if I have more in here. Uh, I guess I don't have an example. Um, so like, an example is like I could have, like in this case it's a handle icon, because this was an idea that I had for table drag. So table drag has like this little, like I don't know if you, you table, the dr table drag interface in the Drupal admin UI is the thing where you drag around rows. You know, and it has like that little icon that indicates you can drag around rows. And right now it's done through a background image. But the problem with background images is background images will not show in um, force colors or high contrast mode. So if y'all don't know this, within Windows, you can turn on high contrast mode. And uh, so if you, like if you have some visual, if you can see but not very good, you can turn on high contrast mode. But background images won't show. So you can, uh, but you can, but you can do things with thing with uh, CSS clip path to basically have the clipping region only show and, and then show the background color, and you can do like the background color. You can use like these special media queries that say the background is the text color. You know, and canvas text is a special keyword that you can if you go to this uh, long URL at the bottom. I'll, I'll show these slides. You go to that long URL at the bottom, it'll show you a bunch of keywords, and it's all on MD, MDN and stuff. 
So this is kind of important for Drupal core because Drupal core has very, very stringent accessibility requirements. Drupal core is like accessible, like it's super accessible. Like when we go, when we create those things, we test it in all these types of browsers. We test it in Windows high contrast mode. We test it underwater. We test it on the moon. It's like tested, you know? And, and so like when there's issues that say, I can't see the icon for the table drag, or I can't see the icon for the shortcut bar, or stuff like that, that becomes a blocker. And then people like me and Christina are like, shit, how do we handle this? And with IE11, IE11 was like saying, punch in the face. And now we're saying, get out of here. And, and, and we're able to find new ways to do that. So, yes. So my favorite thing, all right, so I said there was three favorite things. Like, so my th three favorite things are grid, where, and CSS variables. I think CSS variables might be number one. My daughter is now, she's, she's the, I don't know. But, CSS variables in Drupal 9, I talked about this a little bit, they're compiled during the build step. So when I say in the build step, like, we write in Drupal core, we write post CSS files, and then we run a compile step similar to SAS, and it generates the regular CSS files. So this means that all the CSS variables that we have defined get transpiled into their values. And so we have, like, all that extra... Um, I think this is the slide that probably made its way earlier that, that I was talking about. We've got all these extra... Uh, uh, C uh, CSS custom properties here, CSS variables, that we have one for every single breakpoint, and that gets like a little hard to manage. And there's my sad face. Um, so without Internet Explorer 11, we can use CSS variables properly. So that means if I define one CSS variable and I say like, I, like let's say we're, we're doing a spacing unit. Say I want my spacing unit at the small breakpoint to be 10 pixels, and then I can create a media query, and I can, I can then override that CSS variable in the media query and say, at medium width, the spacing variable is 15 pixels, and then at wide width, the, the spacing variable is 10, is, is uh, 20 pixels, or something like that. And then the browser will automatically use these media queries to determine uh, what the correct value is, and it just kind of works automatically which is really neat. This issue to, uh, to fix this uh, in D10 is already merged. So it says RTBC, but it is fixed. It is done. So this is good. So Christina and I and Larry Eskla, who is a core committer, and then uh, Ben Mullins, who's an, who's an accessibility maintainer and core committer, we've been having this discussions about the CSS variable architecture and the thing about uh, Drupal APIs is Drupal one of the reasons that you're all here is because Drupal APIs are pretty fairly robust and we take backwards compatibility pretty 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 uh, we take backwards compatibility very seriously and there's this promise right here that says easy upgrades for forever so you're never going to have that d7 to d8 upgrade problem that, that a lot of people are currently going through. You know, Drupal 8 to Drupal 9 was, it was a lot easier, and Drupal 9 to Drupal 10 is going to be a lot easier. So we have to make sure that we get it right. We have to make sure that, like, the CSS custom properties that Drupal defines, we, d we don't want to screw it up. We don't want to define one and then realize we did it wrong, because then we have to still have to support it forever, because it's an API. So, like, totally no pressure. So, um, we're, we're, we have a lot of ideas, and, and I can, if my internet was working, I would show you some of the stuff that we've gone through, but we're talking about, like, creating, uh, like, some generic variables for, like, spacing unit, primary colors, secondary colors, font sizes, line heights, and stuff like that. And the way that we're doing this right now, I don't yet have a slide for this, is, is we're going to have, like, a CSS class called root-frontend, root or root-admin. And we're going to attach that to the HTML element on, uh, within the various theme. And what's going to be really cool about that is that you'll be able to nest those, because there's certain situations in Drupal 
where you'll be on the front end theme, which might be aloe vera or your own custom theme, but you'll have an ad, you'll have an admin component rendered in, rendered within there. That might be the settings tray or the uh, toolbar or the uh, media library or something like that. But if the front end component is specifying all these CSS variables, we don't want those to filter down into the admin component. So what we, what we can do is at the root of the admin component, we can just say root dash admin. And, 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 and we can do the same thing uh, on, the, on the admin side, on the administrative side uh, of Drupal 10. You, it's possible to have front end components render in the administrative size side in a place where this is going to happen is in the new CK editor 5 where CK editor 5 when you're editing your text you want to see the font system that you have in your front end thing because you want to know how it's, what it's going to look like you know so we're going to be able to do that we're talking about uh, doing uh, we're going to preface we're going to we're going to namespace things with Drupal um, we're not going to have those double dashes in there and, and some of the things are going to change from this but but we're going to we're going to namespace it so it doesn't conflict with like any other maybe front end libraries that you might have. You might have libraries like I don't know Bootstrap. There's like a million front end libraries, and we don't want to conflict with anything. You know, we want this just to work. So don't create front end libraries called Drupal if there are SOL. Well. Um, so yeah. Um, Is there any plan to coordinate those with? Uh, I think it's called Smacks. Where they sort them by, I think it's, I forget the categories. But like yeah, five. yeah, so so Drupal, so the question is coordinating those with SMACs. So, like, SMACs is, what is it, scalar molecular architecture for CSS? I read it last night. Is like yeah, and, and, like, we do a little bit of that. We do, like, the is dash whatever, but this is more of, like, a naming scheme, you know? And one of the things that we've been talking about is we don't want to overdo these variables. We, if anything, we want to have, we want to have less. You know, we we don't want to specify things that people are not going to use. We don't want to create too large of an API. So we're, I don't think we're doing anything with Smacks in there. But Smacks to me is more about like kind of organization. Yeah, if that like makes sense. Some kind of like fonts versus themes versus pieces. Versus yeah, and then. We're only we're only going to specify maybe something like twenty odd at the most twenty odd uh, CSS variables there. So, go ahead. Right. Since the session got canceled today, there's going to be a uh, Tailwind mm -hmm. session. So to use Tailwind, you'd have to create a Tailwind theme. Mm -hmm. So that would not be applicable to no, this at all. Right. It wouldn't. I mean, you know, it can't. It sits wouldn't. on top. Of yeah, so, so what Tailwind does is, like, Tailwind is a very granular utility library, you know, so, so like, tail, like I, I, I did one Drupal site with Tailwind, and it, it worked, but, like, I did find some, like, there are some places where, you know, I was writing stuff, and I'm like, I should just be writing regular, regular CSS at this point. Like, um... I think it's the it inlines the CSS, doesn't it? CSS. Yeah, well, it doesn't, Tailwind does not inline the CSS, it creates granular uh, CSS uh, classes that you then kind of inline. So it looks a little bit like inline, but it's not inline. Mm -hmm. It's a lot like Bootstrap. What's up? So, so would there be some sort of graphical interface for managing the CSS variables? That's a really good question. Right now, like that would be possible. And I can, I can, as soon, if my internet works, I can show you some cool stuff that that, that that we're doing that's like that. But right now, we're just trying to get it right. That could that could easily be coming. Like I would love. That's actually like a great idea. Like I would love to see something like that in Contrib, and then potentially pull it into Drupal Core if it's popular enough. Or let that replace the pillar module. I guess. Yeah. Well, yeah. So we're talking about that. Like, there's um, Andy Bloom who did the uh, CSS training yesterday, is working on a patch for Olivera to uh, basically use CSS variables to change the color in Olivera. If my CSS, if my internet working, I, I can demo that for you. So this. I, I refactored the tabs component in Olivero, and this is what I think things can look like right here. So, like, you know Drupal tabs, you know, you got view, edit, you know, other tabs across the top. Like, for me, like, as a front-end developer, when I create a new theme, the last thing I want to do is have to deal with tabs. You know, like, there's, it's just like, it's just one extra thing. So, I want to give these to people, 
And all they need to do is just override these right at the top, and then it just kind of looks like their thing. You know, and if they want to get more complicated, then they can start overriding selectors. You know, I want to make Drupal's components very easily extendable. So even if you're copying and pasting code into your own thing, you can just do it. I think that would be cool. But wait, there's more. I got lots of memes. <laughs> what the heck am I talking about here? Oh, yeah, so color changing. So this is just, uh, this is there. But we have the color changing stuff working in a, uh, in a uh, merge request on Drupal.org. Right now that there's a test failing and the test is being a pain in the butt because of the night watch system that we use, but it's working. And it's gonna allow you to change the colors to like kind of whatever you want. And then we're even talking about like adding like a secondary color option for Olivero, but that might be coming down the line. Um, I don't know if my internet's working, but, but we'll see if it does. But there's more. So, yeah, right here we go. So, y'all go into like CSS Grid, like I swear these styles sneaked in earlier somehow. Mm -hmm. But like, so CSS Grid, it, or, or not CSS Grid, I'm sorry. So when you go into views, you can say, I want a grid style, or I want an unformatted list, or I want a table. But who here has used the grids and views? Yeah, you got one hand back there, because it sucks. It's not responsive. It's hor I would actually volunteer to say it's horrible. It was written back when Views 2 was around, probably in like 2009, and like things weren't responsive then. You know, I don't even know if media queries were a thing. So we're redoing that, like, we're gonna, we're gonna input like these, we're gonna have Views output these inline styles, and then it's just gonna filter directly down into it. And I have a working patch, and it's awesome. And if my internet works, I can show this to you. So another thing is JavaScript, of course, can in, inject the, the, uh, the CSS variables also. So like, who here, like, if you ever have worked on like a fixed header, you know, a header that's always sticky to the top or something like that, and then you log in, and then you're like, oh crap, the toolbar, <laughs> the toolbar's in the way of it, you know? And you're like, ah, screw it. You know, it only affects my admin users. <laughs> like, you, you like, like, you, like, there's ways to deal with it. So you look at the CSS classes in there, and you're like, all right, well, if this CSS class in there, I gotta add 39 pixels. If mm -hmm. this one's in here, I gotta add 40 pixels. If they're both in here, I gotta divide it by 62 and times the mass of Jupiter and stuff like that. You know? If you wrap it, you have two lines of yeah. admin buttons and whatnot. Yeah. yeah, and like, what if the wrap? Like, it just gets so complicated. There's actually a, a Drupal um, API that's JavaScript only right now that you can do this. So you can like query a Drupal API. It's called Drupal.Displace, and it'll it'll say the top is using you know 72 pixels, the right is using 68 pixels, and things like that. It's JavaScript only. But why doesn't JavaScript just write these inline these custom properties to the body, and then we can do things like this? Like my fixed header, and I can just say top, the top is this if it exists, and then this is just a fallback value, zero. So that would like solve that problem, and it would just work. It would just work, and it would be awesome, you know? So, like, we're working really hard to kind of like get it right the first time, and, and we're thinking about it, we're giving a lot of thoughts. We're like, like right now, the, uh, the place where this is at is like, I think Christina and Lowry and I were were putting together some demos. Is that where it's sitting right now? Probably for the CSS stuff. Where we're going to see if it works. And I haven't done it yet because I've been concentrating on Florida Drupal Camp, but I want to do it this coming week, maybe tomorrow. So I'm excited about this. So there's a CSS modernization initiative. I created an issue. You can see it right there, and that's what it looks like if you don't actually feel like navigating to it. And uh, yeah, so. That's me. I'm going to see if my internet's working because I got some cool stuff to show. No, no. Hey, look at that. So I wrote this. Um, see if I have this. So I have this views responsive grid thing right here. So, so this one is green. This is the module that, or this is the patch for Drupal core that is going to create a new, instead of views grid, it's going to say views responsive grid. 
And I think I have a preview up here with Tugboat if I scroll up. I'm gonna see if this works. Oh, I gotta hurry up too, because I gotta run over. Oh yeah, I'm logged in. So like, here's, I have this in bar tick right here. But the way this works, I'm gonna edit this view. What is this? Uh, how do I edit the view? Structure, views, what is this, uh, grid. So we have this, instead of views grid, it's gonna say views responsive grid. And then in here, you're gonna have these settings here. So you're gonna specify the maximum number of columns, you're gonna specify the minimum grid, grid cell width. And the thing is, as the grid cells approach this width, if, they get, if it looks like it's gonna go under, the, the grid will readjust itself, and it will just have less columns. And then you can specify your gutter spacing there too. It's gonna come with the fall phase. Yeah, and it's just gonna work. It's just gonna work, it's just <laughs> awesome. And so anyway, I'm super excited about that. I gotta run over to the uh, auditorium for the Drupal board Q&A and the AV situation is all messed up and I'm very nervous about it so I, I can't take too many questions. But do you have any one or two questions maybe? All right. Thank you.